dear guests. I hope you enjoyed your coffee and refreshments. And now we're going to continue our seminar. And uh, to be... <laughs> yes, to be more practical and uh, to speak about more practical things, we are going to demonstrate to you one of, uh, one of the examples of, of the best practices in Barinsk cooperation. So first, we would like to touch upon uh, one of the most sensitive uh, subjects in today's East and Western um, relations. This is information. The Barinsk Press Networks, uh, Network unites journalists from all the Barinsk countries. And now they will tell us how to prevent the one-sided media coverage, which usually happens during geopolitical crisis. So, um, please, floor is yours. Welcome to Amon Trelevik, leader of Barents Press Norway and a journalist uh, NRK, Norwegian state broadcasting company, and to Anna Kireva, leader of Barents Press International and head of communication at environmental organization Bilona. Good dog. Good <laughs> We speak the same language, <laughs> <laughs> even though we are different. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Amund Trelevik. Amund Trelevik. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a journalist in the NRK, uh, the Norwegian Broadcasting uh, um, Company in Finnmark, um, and also the chairman of Barnes Press Norway. Well, my name is Anna Kireva. I'm, uh, I'm a journalist and the head of information office of uh, Bellona in Murmansk. And also I'm a chairman of Barnes Press Russia and currently chairman of the Barnes Press International. Yeah, so we are here today to talk about one of the most successful stories in the whole Barnes Corporation. And we talk about Barnes Press, of course. And we dare to say this because media writes that. <laughs> So, for 20 years ago, there was a small group of uh, uh, journalists and editors, enthusiasts, that saw this opportunity uh, when the Cold War was over, we, 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 we didn't have the Soviet Union anymore, we had Russia to cooperate um, when it comes to media across the border that used to be almost physically closed. Yes, and uh, through these 20 years, the journalists of Barents region managed to build trust, uh, cooperation and a good platform for making good stories on the both sides of the border. The aim of the Barents Press is to, uh, of the journalists in the Barents Press, is to learn from each other, to cooperate, to work together and to know each other better. And we do it through uh, numerous uh, seminars, study trips and annual meetings. Um, Yep. Yeah, this picture is from our last meeting in Haparanda in Sweden in this year. Haparanda is the border city to Finland, or to Sweden, as you can see it. Uh, this is our four chairmen of the Barnes Press, Finland, Sweden, Russia and Norway. Um, the thing is that uh, many things have changed uh, since this picture was taken in Kirkenes in June 2013. This is uh, Prime Minister uh, Medvedev and Stoltenberg uh, actually walking from the Russian side of the border towards the Norwegian side of the border. Um, at, at this time, the Norwegian-Russian cooperation and the level of friendliness maybe was on the highest ever in the history. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you agree. But yeah, I do agree. And the situation changed very uh, soon and very rapidly. And only with the changed political situation, we in Barents Press could see the actual result of the cooperation. Uh, the result in the way the Barents media works and covers the political changes. Of course, the propaganda works on the both sides. But uh, when it comes to B uh, Russian Barents region media, uh, when they cover, for example, Norway, First of all, Norway is a good neighbor of Russia and then a part of NATO. Yeah, and maybe it's not like that in other parts of Russia. I don't know. Well, it's, of course it's different. Yeah, yeah. I uh, just want to mention that um, the way media sees Russia is, of course, very different when it uh, comes to Oslo and sort of as Norway and, of course, the northern part of Norway. I know that because I have working at, I've been working as a journalist and also in Oslo. 
and now in, in Finnmark. Uh, and I believe that the Barnes uh, Press Network uh, and all the, um, how to say it, both professional but also personal friendship that, that you gain uh, in different medias is of, uh, of course uh, a useful resource in your journalism work. And we faced very good uh, examples in the recent couple of years when journalists really were working together on the news uh, from both sides of the border or helping each other, giving each other calls to, to find out what's going on. Yeah, last year this happened. Uh, suddenly the Syrians came to the north. Um, nobody knew what to do, uh, even in media that have been reporting on the, on, on, on the fighting in Syria for five years, uh, was kind of shocked that someone came uh, and wanted to seek asylum in Norway. So um, this picture is um, probably among one of the first 100 uh, refugees that came across the border from Russia into uh, Norway uh, last uh, autumn to seek asylum. Um, this was uh, the number uh, increased day by day, uh, and in media we was like, what to do? Uh, <laughs> and um, but uh, through the Barnes Press Network, um, local journalists in Finnmark had the possibilities to make calls to our colleagues in Murmansk, ask for help, for comments from Russian official um, persons departments, and also when we went to Murmansk, we often get help, um, so-called fixer in Murmansk. And uh, very important is to mention uh, the professionalism of the Barnes Press regional, Russian Barnes Press regional journalists when it comes to very hot political topics as LGBT, foreign agents, uh, NGOs, and um, indigenous peoples. Well, some of you might know that uh, the Belono office in Murmansk was registered as a foreign agent uh, NGO last year, and as a head of information office, I was really scared that we would face the same situation as the media did with other NGOs in other regions of Russia, with humiliating stories, with uh, threatening when uh, people had their, a lot of problems after that, uh, living in the regions where they used to live. But it didn't happen in Murmansk when Belona Murmansk was uh, registered as foreign agent. We had very professional, based -orient, effect oriented uh, media, very neutral, very, um, very smooth and soft. They were just giving facts and uh, quotations from, from both sides. I was really impressed by professionalism of the Barnes region media. And it also comes to indi indigenous people. I think peoples. it's because of uh, the learning from each other. And this is how real journalism should work. I can just add that, uh, of course, uh, journalists in, in Finnmark have a different approach on Russia than journalists in Oslo. And yeah, I think there's many reasons for that. Um, <laughs> the last thing um, I, I just want to mention, because um, uh, just to give you a feeling uh, on uh, how great the Barnes Press Network works, because a couple of uh, weeks ago we were denied uh, access to this uh, nuclear um, uh, site in Murmansk region uh, on technical issues. Um, so, but since, uh, since I know this journalist here, Jelena Belkina, for many years, um, she's working in a competition in uh, Getraka Murman, that is a kind of uh, state on Russian television channel. Uh, I just asked her to make footage for our uh, story. So we uh, didn't get access, but we had a story through um, her material. And it was very simple, because usually when you want a foreign journalist, a foreign media needs something from the Russian media, like some, some videos, some archives, they write the official letter, they can wait for several days or weeks, they need a permission from the leader, and here you can make a phone call and you will get what you need the next day. Mm -hmm. It was actually an SMS. Uh, okay. <laughs> but it's very easy, uh, and, um, and I believe that um, uh, this is how uh, journalists and networks should uh, work. Uh, we, in, in Norway and in Russia we face all the same challenges when it comes to uh, declining of circulation in newspaper, um, cutting advertising. Yeah, we fa we've faced the same challenges. So we need to cooperate more. I just want to mention, as, you, uh, as was said uh, in the previous presentation, uh, one of the aim of the Barnes Press Network is also to have courses and seminars to yeah, 
uh, on different topics. Last topics we had was this trip to Svalbard, um, a very Russian. sensible. Um, very sensible area, and it was devoted today. to the Russian Norwegian cooperation in uh, fisheries. The course was uh, named Who Owns the Fish? Yeah. So and it was a very fish? successful one. Yeah. I um, just want to add uh, a comment. Um, uh, this representative from the Russian uh, delegation to European Parliament, uh, European Union, um, uh, Malayan, uh, he said that he was hoping to get visa free access for tourists uh, in Arkhangelsk and uh, Murmansk for 72, 72 hours. I just want to, maybe there's somebody else from the Russian embassy here, I don't know. But um, maybe the Russian Federation, the Russian government also should look into if there is any possibilities to, uh, to not have the system of accreditation for journalists in Russia. Because that's a very bureaucratic, old-fashioned style of bureaucracy towards journalists. Even the Russian journalists, when they get to know what Norwegian journalists had to go through to get the accreditation, we get very surprised because the only thing the Russian journalist needs to work in Norway is the visa. Tourist visa. Tourist visa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, is there any questions? Just um, to, to, to be the first <laughs> to, and to let the others also, maybe they have some questions. Uh, I have a question. Nowadays, we have a huge amount of information and it comes from everywhere. Can you give um, us advice how to separate uh, propaganda from the facts? How to tell maybe what's the truth in the mass media that we are reading, listening to? What can you say? I First of all, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, don't trust Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Many people believe that Facebook is a kind of a newspaper. It is not. Um, yeah, uh, just um, uh, it's a very interesting question, especially for Russian readers, because there is a lot of contradiction uh, in in the information. But read many sources and uh, just answer your, a question to yourself: What is the fact and what is the comment to something? So when you read the facts, it's okay. In Russia, we have a very interesting situation now with the media because we have uh, so-called two generations, I would say that. And it doesn't depend on the age. We have a generation of TV and a generation of internet. And these are completely different generations with completely different knowledge and information. Check your sources. <laughs> That's, uh, if, you, if you hear something you believe might be not very true, just find another source for it. Thank you. It's a guy in the I want to add, please don't trust Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is killing the media. Um, hello, my name is Marcus Harsten, and I'm working for Finnmark County Authority. I, maybe you could outline what is Barnes Press as such? Like technically, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we are a group of journalists that meets on a regular basis. Um, um, we are we are not an organization. That's important to underline. Because when we are an organization, we will immediately be facing different issues. Yeah, issues like, for instance, Bologna did. Um, so we are a network of professional journalists and editors. Everybody that works in media in the Barnes region can join the network as long as you can uh, present yourself as I work in our media. Uh, we, um, we are, um, and that's both the strengths and the weakness to the network. Um, we, uh, every year we meet for our annual meeting. I don't know why it's called the annual meeting, because it's more like a conference. Um, a group of approximately 150 journalists from Finland, Sweden, Russia, and Norway. And that's the most important place uh, we meet every year. Uh, we discuss things like uh, Crimea, information war in, in uh, Ukraine, uh, professional standards in media. Of course, there are different, and there's different standards of um, 
ethical when it comes to yes, ethical in yes. Russian and Russian media, of course. And but um, yeah. Um, yeah, you said that there is. Hello, my name is Anja Salo. I work at the Norwegian Barn Secretariat. You said that there is a big difference between journalists working in Finnmark and journalists working in Oslo, and you never explained what the difference is. Could you do that, please? Uh, <laughs> well, I did say that there is difference in the reports it was Russia. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, um, uh, maybe you can help me on that. But I, I believe that um, when you, um, when you on, from time to time travel to the area of reporting on, uh, when you know journalists, as I can call Anna and ask for help with a story, or to my friends in Arkhangelsk mm -hmm. or Petrosovodsk, um, that makes you more. Is there any journalist from Oslo here? <laughs> well, no. I, I think it's just the same when we have uh, the same difference as the journalist in, for example, Murmansk region and the journalist in Moscow or in other regions of Russia. Uh, they are not familiar with the Norway. They have never been there, but they write about it as they have been there and been the evident of everything. And uh, like if they are the, the truth, the highest truth ever. So uh, the Mormonsk stories about Mor uh, Norway is very polite, is very friendly, and uh, because Mormonsk journalist knows what uh, what Norway um, did for this Barents cooperation. Just to give an example, so maybe to um, that can explain um, it. Um, during the Syrian uh, refugee crisis, there was this story going on that Russia had this hybrid war against Norway with the refugees. That was mainly based of written by people that was based in south of Norway. So, but when we looked into it, the journalists in the north, we found out that on the Russian side, there was uh, even more, there were even more um, critical um, to say it. They had really tough times with re re refugees, and they told us that there is totally insane that we would force you to take all these refugees. We have so much problem with this in Russia. And uh, the way we, we had this comment, we just went there and asked them, the mayor in Nikol. And he told us that it was totally chaos here. So it's absurd to uh, say that we are doing a hybrid war against Norway, for instance. There's a comment in the back. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, my name is uh, Arno Holm. I'm the editor of the newspaper High North News, covering business and politics in, in the Arctic. And I think I could help you help you out a little bit with Anja's question. Uh, and I think, uh, actually, and I had to look here, Lisa Jakonsari, in a way, pinpointed what is the difference between journalism from the South and journalism made in the area when she was talking about how the European Union overlook the local communities and the local business in the high north when they are discussing the Arctic politics. Living among the business, living among the people, living among the, the industry uh, uh, makes a totally different approach to writing the stories when you understand how the way uh, politics and business works in the north. And that is one of the important reasons that we need organizations like what, what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. If uh, no further questions, I think we will go to the next session.
Yes, another challenging sector for cooperation, but also a uniting one, with many great prospects in the future to come. Let's talk indigenous people in the Barents region. Please welcome to Tatiana Yegorova, head of the Barents Indigenous People Office. And herself also Sami of origin. The Barents Indigenous People Office also work as a secretariat for the Joint Working Group on Indigenous Affairs. So please, Tatiana. Hello everybody, my name is Tatiana Egorova and I'm Sami from Kola Peninsula in Russia. Uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, managing uh, Barents Indigenous Peoples Office and Secretary for Working Group on Indigenous Peoples in Barents region. So, my task today is to talk about uh, Indigenous Peoples Cooperation in our region. And it's quite logical to start with who we are. Uh, which indigenous peoples are represented in Barents region. So here you can see a picture of our wonderful indigenous. We have uh, uh, Sami people in four lands, in Norway, Sweden, uh, Russia and Finland. We have uh, Nenets people in uh, Nenets Autonomous Okrug in Russia. And we have Veps people in the Republic of Karelia in Russia. So how do we cooperate in the Barents region? Well, uh, on political level, uh, the political cooperation uh, is channelized through the working group on indigenous peoples in Barents Euro-Arctic Euro region. And uh, here you can see on the picture representatives of our working group. It's almost all ladies. It's a uh, girl power, you know. <laughs> well, um, we have uh, uh, one representative of, from Sami people in four lands, and we have one, one Nenets and one Webs representative. So the purpose, the purpose of the working group is to serve a forum for indigenous peoples' cooperation in the Barents Euro-Arctic region, and also to ensure the involvement of indigenous peoples in decision-making process in in Barents region. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, working group of indigenous peoples has a high political dimension within the Barents cooperation. In the formal Barents structure, working group on indigenous peoples is placed at the national level, at the, at the national level under the foreign ministers, while other working groups are regional authorities' responsibility. So working group has an advisory status towards uh, Barents Euro-Arctic Council and also to Barents Regional Council. So here on the picture you can see us meeting in Finland with the committee of senior officials where we rise up our issues on national level. And we're also participating in the meetings of Barents Regional Co uh, Council where we sit at the same table with the governors of our region. So, <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, well, uh, what I want to say is this unique position where indigenous peoples and politic politicians and officials are meeting together, get, getting to know each other, uh, do start to understand each other better. It's a very unique position and we are happy, very happy to have it. Um, and we will continue to do the same way. Uh, every second year, indigenous politicians in Barents Euro Arctic region meet uh, during the Barents Indigenous Peoples Congress, where we uh, discuss important issues for indigenous peoples in Barents and where we underline our pri priorities. So last time, uh, uh, about 100 participants met in Tromsø, Norway, and discussed, uh, di discussed issues about indigenous people's languages and extractive industries on indigenous people's lands. To the Congress, we invite um, representatives both from regional and national level authorities and uh, different experts, um, yes, and business companies, of course. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of projects within Barents Corporation. 
and I will not speak a lot about our projects, I will mention just a few of them. One project in DG project, it is, it is very famous and uh, it is uh, very popular and uh, well known uh, by the authorities of our, of, by, by the regional and national authorities. The INDG project is a, a youth entrepreneurship project and um, their logo is boosting successful business based on indigenous knowledge. So uh, simply, uh, the idea of project is, was based on the principles of strengthening regional development by means of contributing to economic development of the indigenous communities in the regions. Uh, so we uh, hope, hope that it will be a continuation of this project and maybe we will include Arctic and other Arctic regions too. And um, here you can see our more <laughs> lot-faced cultural cooperation. We have, um, well, it is uh, different workshops, seminars, festivals, where people, indigenous peoples and other indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples in the Barents region and indigenous peoples from, all, from the whole world meet, get acquainted, uh, build important networks and uh, yeah, start to understand each other better. Um, well, uh, we do of course have challenges, um, not to mention uh, language barriers and different mentality and uh, different state structures which we are working with within the cooperation. Uh, we have um, the same challenges as all indigenous peoples in the world have. It is, of course, an issue about um, language. Indigenous peoples' languages are disappearing, although we have a very good example uh, on uh, uh, preservation of language in Karelia in, uh, uh, in um, Russia. But still, uh, it is a lot of work which must be done in that area. Uh, and um, another challenge is, of course, it is um, land and uh, use of land and natural resources, uh, rights, uh, indigenous peoples' rights for land and water, rights for free, prior, and informed consent. And um, I decided to show you this picture, which was uh, shown in Yamala uh, Nenets uh, Okrug. It's made by regional authorities in the Amala Nenes Okrug and you can see that the way they can they see how indigenous people's communities traditional way of living can coexist with the oil industry it is not the way indigenous people sees that it is not going to function like that so uh, and it's on, not only Russia who, 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 who have issues with indigenous peoples it's all lands so uh, yeah I hope uh, here we also have a great arena for working and for making a dialogue. Um, during our work, we also faced some technical challenges. Um, in we had the lack of uh, financial support to the activity of working group on indigenous peoples. So although the Chirkinas Declaration stressed the importance of uh, strengthening uh, the indigenous people's re representation in the Barents Corporation, we experienced uh, great financial difficult difficulties at that time. And here you can see uh, uh, Lash Bar, uh, representative of a working group, uh, talking at the Barents Summit in, in 2013 and explaining to officials that that uh, if we should be taken serious, we need support. So, but that, that was back then. Uh, today, I'm really glad to, to, say, uh, to say that since last year, we have a permanent uh, contribution from, four, four, from all four lands, and that really inspires us, and we are eager to continue to work and make a lot of events. Yes. So, Russian Federation is now chairing Barents Euro Arctic Council, and um, 
uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, Mr. Lavrov, uh, came when he came to Oulu to a Foreign Minister's meeting in October last year. He he stressed the importance of Barents cooperation, and he underlined the Russian priorities. So one of Russian priorities was indigenous peoples in the Barents region, and now we are cooperating with the Committee of Senior Officials on uh, conducting first Barents Indigenous Peoples Summit, which we will uh, which will be conducted in Moscow next year, and. Um, uh, minister, Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, fully supports the uh, the uh, <laughs> initiative of Working Group on Indigenous Peoples on conducting such an event. So, um, even though the situation between Russia and West is tense uh, lately, we do experience that Barnes co cooperation uh, was is not affected by that and is still going on like like it was before and uh, yes we are eager to continue and we are very positive to make dialogue thank you for your attention so we have some um, brief uh, minutes for questions if anyone have, I think I would like to ask one question. Uh, <laughs> if you could outline a little bit more, what have the Barents Corporation meant to indigenous people in the region? In the regions? In the Barents region, yeah. What has it, have it meant for the indigenous people? Have it well, helped them in some way? Of course. Of course. If you could outline that a little bit. Oh, okay, Barents Indigenous Peoples Cooperation had meant a lot for indigenous peoples in our regions. And for the most, I will say that it meant a lot for, for example, Kola, uh, Sami people on the Russian side, because uh, after 19th, uh, we, um, we were a bit, um, uh, well, um, because of Barents Indigenous Cooperation and different projects, uh, Indigenous peoples on the Russian side became more interested in, in, in the culture and start to be interested in their history and start to work on and be, exp um, and be uh, yeah, um, well, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm Lisa Hombri. I'm coming from the uh, Finnish side of the SAPMI and I'm uh, rector of the Sami Education Institute and I, I will warmly thank you, the Barents Secretariat and uh, all, the, all the financial and the technical help. We have had uh, many, many projects, uh, indigenous people's projects, um, uh, tourism projects, uh, reindeer education projects. Uh, the last project which uh, you have been financing was the Arctic skills, so the Murmansk and the Sami people and uh, Norwegian people we were, and the Finnish people of course, I, I was almost forgetting them. <laughs> we were competing in the vocational education skills and uh, it was very good way to get uh, uh, young people together. You mentioned the Indigi project. It has been very good for the indigenous peoples um, or Sami people, young people, to make our, our, our own company. So very many things has happened. Thank you. These are for your conclusion of my presentation <laughs> or for answering Timmes' question. There are some, um, some more challenges uh, in, uh, in the Barnes region and actually um, maybe the century's greatest challenge of all is the, problems, is the problems we face with climate changes and environment. So two of the main global petroleum powers lay in the region. This is Russia and Norway. 
How are they meeting the challenges of today? The Joint Working Group on Environment have been one of the most active and effective group in BR cooperation. With us, we are lucky to have two officials from Russia and Norway, which will give their view on this subject. So, please welcome Maria Dronova from Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Russia, and Helen Johanna Anschen from the Ministry of Climate and Environment, Norway. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for your invitation to come to Brussels and to speak here today. Uh, the, 20th, um, the 20th anniversary of environmental cooperation uh, within the Bar and Arctic Council coincided with uh, the Russian chairmanship of the BIAC Working Group on Environment in 2014-2015. During uh, the period of uh, 20 years, many projects aimed at solving uh, environmental challenges uh, um, in the Barents region have been successfully implemented, including the ones uh, contributing to hotspots tackling uh, projects on water management, conservation of rich uh, biological diversity um, of the sensitive Barents region. Uh, still a lot has to be considered and done to promote sustainable and environmentally sound development of the region. Uh, acknowledging that climate change, pressure on natural resources, increased environmental risks, uh, pollution of the environment and loss of biodiversity are still the major environmental challenges we, that we have today. The Working Group on Environment continues its efforts under its uh, thematic subgroups. Uh, subgroup on elimination of the hotspots. They are all in the Russian part of the Barents region. Subgroup on nature protection, subgroup on water issues, subgroup on cleaner production and environmentally sound consumption. Attention is also paid to climate change issues, quite new theme that is uh, cross-cutting and uh, is considered not only by the working group on environment. What are the Barents hotspots? Hotspots are the sites that are um, polluted, the, uh, or the ones that have been polluted, and pose both environmental and uh, healthy risks. The Working Group on Environment started to work on hotspots in um, 1995. Uh, then the report was updated with the um, active involvement of AMAP and NAFCA in 2003. Um, the goal was set by the ministers responsible for environment of, uh, for countries to launch um, relevant investment projects in all of the hotspots and the real work started in 2010 with the elaboration of the hotspot exclusion procedure that we are currently implementing. Um, this picture shows uh, the distribution of the hotspots. Um, the red dots um, represent uh, the acute environmental problems that still exist, and the green ones uh, show, uh, show the excluded hotspots. We have uh, nine of them. Um, all of the nine hotspots um, uh, were excluded in the period starting from 2011-2015. Uh, uh, promotion of environmental improvements and uh, exclusion of the hotspots from the list is um, among the main activities of the working group on environment now. Uh, during the last 10 years, um, environmental modernization um, it's ongoing in many places, such as in the pulp and paper sector, in the waste uh, water treatment sector. Uh, in many places, the, heat, uh, the heating systems have been switched from oil or co coal to natural gas. 
steps uh, to develop comprehensive waste uh, management plans have been taken in many Russian regions. Um, it is um, relevant to say that uh, there has been significant financing in environmental investments by many Russian companies. Some of the most um, advanced companies have uh, introduced international environmental standards and management systems. There are also Russian federal um, programs that provide funding to improve the quality of drinking water and Russian regions and to clean up uh, the accumulated environmental damage from the past, for instance. Uh, plus, what uh, gives an added value of, uh, of our um, cooperation is the active involvement of um, international financial institutions. Um, Financial institutions uh, like uh, Nordic Environmental Finance Corporation, NAFCA, have eased um, the financial arrangements for some of the main municipal point sources of pollution. Uh, say so by conducting pre-feasibility studies aimed at uh, development modernization projects in Russia. Uh, with um, Exclusion of nine hotspots out of 42. Our work, however, is not yet accomplished. Uh, the principle of environmental management uh, is uh, to aim towards continuous improvements. In order to promote such improvements in the hotspots, uh, an intensive network has been built up between federal and uh, regional authorities within Russia and between the environmental uh, experts in all of the Barents countries. Uh, this uh, network has greatly facilitated uh, the communication links between uh, these hotspots owners and authorities. All stakeholders now, that's the working group on environment, the subgroup on hotspot exclusion, federal, regional authorities, hotspot owners, have shared a great deal of information that uh, has greatly increased the knowledge of environmental problems in Russia and solutions we have, as well as enhanced the capacity to introduce best environmental practices and best environmental technologies. Uh, another a theme that is quite important now is the climate change. Um, the need um, for rapid action to halt the climate change is verified um, by the outcomes of the Paris conference, um, as well as uh, by a vast amount of scientific assessments, including the recent findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, of particular importance for the Barents region is that the region is experiencing more rapid um, changes uh, than uh, regions at the lower latitudes. Consequences of um, the warming are seen already and they are likely to continue and increase. The spring uh, snow um, cover in the northern hemisphere has continued to decrease um, in extent, uh, plus the measured ground temperature in the permafrost zone have increased, uh, the annual mean Arctic sea ice extent has decreased, and so on. These and other changes may have um, a profound effect on flora found on biodiversity itself, as well as on infrastructure and human activities in the region. Uh, to address um, the challenges we are facing today, the challenges of climate change in the region, the Barents Eurarctic Council endorsed the action plan on climate change for the Barents Cooperation in 2013. Uh, the action plan was officially adopted at uh, the BIAC meeting of Environment Minister in December 2013. Um, uh, it is um, going without saying that uh, implementation of the plan uh, was one of the priorities of the Russian chairmanship of the Working Group on Environment and is the priority of the Russian chairmanship in the whole in the BIAC. Uh, the actions are in the plan are grouped in accordance with um, uh, the themes, so that's the climate change mitigation, 
adaptation to climate change, research, observation, monitoring, modeling, outreach. And we have plus one overarching activity, the development of regional climate change strategies. Uh, they, that uh, will greatly contribute to, to national climate uh, goals uh, that four of our countries have. The aim of Barents cooperation is to ensure sustainable development. Climate change has the potential to affect the development more than any other issue. Therefore, this is the theme that um, will be further and thoroughly developed by us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Maria, for uh, giving us an overview of what we are doing in this uh, working group of environment under the Barnes Corporation. So, um, I am now uh, the chair of the working group of environment, and it's good to be here and see so many people interested in the Barnes Corporation and the good work we are doing. So, um, today I will give uh, four examples on best practices on environmental cooperation. So, I will have one uh, example on, on biodiversity and nature protection, and I will have uh, one um, example on hotspots, uh, and I will have one example on environmental monitoring. So, let's go to the Barnes Protected Area Network. Um, this network uh, of cooperation is one of the key projects on biodiversity in the Working Group of Environment. And all the Barnes countries are um, parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD. The Barnes Protected Area Network is a regional initiative to implement this convention. So I will give you one example on how this is. One of the targets in the, in the convention is like this. Um, by 2020, at least 17% of the terrestrial and inland water areas should be conserved through a representative and well-connected system of protected areas. So let's have in mind uh, 17%. So in this project, Barnes Protected Area Network, uh, we have, um, have done this gap analysis uh, and detected the most important sites of biodiversity conservation. And many of these are to be included in national and regu regional plans of protected areas. And today, the Barnes region has 13% uh, of the terrestrial area uh, is already uh, protected for, for um, biodiversity uh, conservation. Uh, countries and regions uh, are um, in process of implementing the plant protected areas identified in this uh, particular project. Uh, and when those plants uh, of protected areas uh, are established, the Barnes region will almost meet the target in the above mentioned um, convention on nearly 17%. So this is uh, a really good example uh, of how uh, interregional cooperation in the Barnes region contributes to the implementation of an international convention. So uh, I have also another good example um, from. Um, Let's start with what is uh, these hotspots in, uh, in general um, and what is the problem? Um, these hotspots represent a serious environmental threat and the forest industry in the Common Republic has been the major source of wood waste, the wood waste problem. The total amount uh, of wood waste might be as large as um, 1.5 million tons per year. So uh, these enormous landfills you see here of wood waste in the Republic of Kome has emissions of uh, the short-lived climaforce methane. And some of the landfills are also in constantly on fire, which is a source to particles as black carbon. 
So, um, Norway has been an important part in, in the improvements for these uh, particular um, uh, hotspots. Since, since, 19, uh, since 2013, the Norwegian consultancy, uh, Norsk Energi, uh, Tekna Trade Union, and the Regional Ministry of Industry and Transport of the Republic of Kome uh, have cooperated on clean production program to promote uh, bioenergy and uh, production in Kome. The Norwegian companies and the Clean Production Centre in Moscow have supported the regional ministry with expert advice, um, as you see here from the picture, um, training programs and advisory assistance for developing uh, investment project. So, what is the strategy to exclude these hotspots from the list? Heating plants in this municipality are based on coal and heavy oil, and are sourced to emission of black carbon and particles, heavy metals as mercury, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide. So these uh, emissions are also a serious threat to human health. So by replacing uh, coal and heavy oil by using pellets or briquettes from wood waste will decrease the airborne uh, emissions from local heating plants and also reduce emission from methane uh, from these landfills you see here. So, to sum up, uh, so far nine factories are developed to produce briquettes and pellets, um, five central heating plants have been converted to bioenergy, four landfills of wood waste are developed, and three combined power and heating stations are based on wood waste. So, uh, just to give you a picture on um, what this really means. Uh, all the improvements have reduced wood waste put on landfill with about um, 3.6 million tons every year. Uh, the implemented project here, uh, in this case, um, will reduce emissions from uh, methane with about 300,000 tons a year. And if we um, say what is this in CO2 equivalents is more, is more or less 700 tons of uh, CO2 equivalents. And to give you a picture on um, um, what, what do I have to do to emit 700 tons of CO2 equivalents? I have to travel from Oslo to Brussels by plane like 1.5 million times. So this, this is huge, uh, this is a huge really. So these uh, improvements are still, if these improvements is still developing, this particular uh, hotspot will be uh, excluded in the near future. So exclusions of uh, hotspots is one of the key priorities for the working group on environment. So let's see, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, as you see here, it's uh, sediments uh, or mud, if you like. And I know very well that uh, some of you will fall asleep uh, seeing uh, this table uh, like this. Uh, unless you made it yourself. And I made this one, and <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very clear for me uh, what that really is. But I would like to illustrate how this might be, uh, how this uh, might make sense for you as well. Uh, we are uh, in this uh, particular project um, analyzing uh, lake bottom sediments in the border area for heavy metals. Uh, the sediments then are sliced into one centimeter layers and layer by layer analysis of these sediments provides specific data on various substances into the environment. And the top layer you have seen here um, is from the last two, three years. 
one minute, I know that. Um, and um, the bottom is the baseline. Uh, and that means uh, will be from 300 or 600 years ago, depending on the sedimentation rate. But uh, it's the baseline um, we compare the results with. So in this template, um, you see the, the red pictures, the red dots. Um, we find that in one particular lake, uh, we could see that um, the concentration of mercury is eight times uh, higher compared to levels before the industrialization. And the concentration of nickel is 27 times higher compared to um, before the industrialization. And uh, in total, this means that uh, this particular lake <coughs> is 75 times more polluted now compared to prior the industrialization. So um, this means that the bottom sediments are useful historical archives and tools to get important knowledge of increased emission from the in industry in, in the border area in the north. <laughs> So just to sum up, in this project, a harmonized monitoring program is developed. Monitoring methods, methods used by the three countries in the border area were harmonized and standardized, including an assessment methodology at all stages, as in fieldwork, in analysis, in data analysis, and in the assessment, and in reporting. So this makes the results comparable between the countries and are so the important information for environmental authorities in the border area. So, thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, then <laughs> I have one question again. So uh, I would like to know, if this joint working group on environment uh, interact with uh, local Russian-Norwegian projects which are supported by Norwegian Barring Secretariat, so do you have some uh, cooperation with them? The Barring Secretariat? No, I mean the projects, ecological projects which are supported by Norwegian Barring Secretariat. Uh, actually, I don't know if um, the project in our group are supported by the, um, the Barnes Secretariat. Do you know, Maria? No, actually, <laughs> the situation is a little bit different. We have from uh, bilateral projects implemented um, between Russia and Norway. Say here. Uh, we have um, bilateral projects that are implemented by Russia and by Norway. Um, the ones that we also consider within the working group on environment, but unfortunately without engagement of the Norwe uh, Norwegian ba uh, Baron Secretariat. The one and the most, um, I would say, challenging one is the Kolska Mining com Company. It is uh, the issue that always discussed um, uh, between our countries on bilateral level, and uh, that's the hot spot that we also consider um, in our working group on the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I think I would like to ask a question as, as well. Uh, do you have any <coughs> plans? for greener energy projects, except from the, you had uh, turning waste into biofuel, but do you have any wind project, for example? I heard some rumors about some wind projects in the nets, uh, some windmills. I don't know if you are acquainted with that. No, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I haven't heard about uh, any wind project. Mm, no, we don't have it within our group, without the working group on environment. But uh, uh, we have some cross-cutting, um, um, cross-cutting, I would say, events that have been that uh, the, uh, that um, at which we discuss the green technologies, green energy supplies um, that were um, held during um, the Finnish chairmanship in the working group on environment four years ago. That was. Um, 
green mining, something like this, and a uh, green mining conference, and um, we had a clean tech summit, also with the cross-cutting themes. Yeah. But then I, I could also add that in the, um, in the hotspot um, cooperation and in the, in the process of excluding the, the different hotspots, and green uh, economy and uh, green technology uh, will uh, somehow be the solution on excluding the, the specific hotspot. So um, we are in a very interesting um, period of time when uh, Russia implementing the, the new law on the best it's available, available technology. technology. So uh, let's see, see how it goes. Any further questions? Thank you. What cooperation as soft diplomacy have existence in ancient Greece, actually. It was how the Olympics started. And it's also a really important measure in the Barnes cooperation. As long back as uh, during the Cold War, for example, we had different sport events uh, crossing the border. And I think it's even more important now in these days when we have have some troubles in in the higher politics to to meet and to play and 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 have different kind of sporting events. And with us today uh, to talk about the sport cooperation, we have my Bente Eriksson, uh, a local Bosfjordaring from Finnmark, and the leader of the Barn Sport Committee. She's also the leader of the local sport committee in Finnmark County. So please welcome up to the stage. Thank you. And uh, I would also like to thank you for, for inviting me here and, and giving me the opportunity to speak about sports, which is uh, one of the most important parts of life. Uh, in 1960, the first formal agreement, uh, a sports agreement between Murmansk Oblast and East Finnmark Sports Federation was written. Uh, this agreement made it possible for, for athletes to cross the border uh, and play sports. And during the Cold War, this was one of the few ways ordinary people could cross the border uh, at Sorskog and, and go to Murmansk or, or come to, to Finnmark. Uh, this agreement has been renewed countless times since that, uh, in 1960. And in 2015, uh, we renewed the agreement in Murmansk, and also this time Finnmark County was a part of the agreement. Last year, 7,000 sports exchanges, 7,000 athletes took part in bar and sports, in all these sports. Uh, we are experiencing increased funding, increased focus and more activity. More sports wants to join, other uh, wants to come and learn, and we see uh, these times as golden times for sports. Because even though the, the climate, the changing difficulties, people-to-people uh, -people cooperation is, com is flourishing. Uh, and uh, our main objective is, is young people between the age of 15 and to 10, 25. Uh, and they are the future of the Barents region. Uh, in 1997, Russian, Russia took an uh, official place in the Barents sports, and we changed the name from Kalot Idret to Barents sports, uh, going from, from uh, the cooperation of, of Norway, Sweden, and Finland, in, and we included Russia in the cooperation. Uh, Barn Sports Committee, that's, uh, Norway is the, it's the chair and I'm the leader uh, in, in this period. 
uh, but we also have national committees in all four countries. Uh, we have a board with two representatives from each uh, country and we meet approximately four times a year. Uh, and we see that meeting and uh, discussing topics, cooperating uh, with sports is a valuable way of making friends across borders. One of the main events of uh, our uh, cooperation is the Barents Games. In April this year, 800 athletes between 15 and 25 met at the Barnes Winter Games in Murmansk. Uh, it was a unique way of uh, making different sports, 10 different sports, uh, coming together in one large game. Uh, we met in Aulu for the Barnes Summer Games in April the year before, and then coming to Murmansk and uh, being part of this fantastic event was very, very uh, a great way for us. We work with this every year and then coming there and, and seeing it being a success, it was a great feeling. Uh, as Tim uh, told you, I, I'm from the small town of Botsfjord in Finnmark. 2,000 people live there. We have a swimming pool. It's uh, 12 and a half meters long. We have a swimming club. They enjoy swimming, and uh, I was so happy to, to be, we had three young 15-year-old swimmers from my town, and they came to Murmansk, and they entered the swimming hall, and the swimming pool is 50 meters long. <laughs> and this dimension, with, with uh, our similarities and our, our differences, uh, I can only imagine the stories they told when they com came home. And uh, you can see on, on uh, social media uh, the pictures they're posting, and, and this, is, this is people to people cooperation. And, and then with the, with the Ukraine crisis and uh, sanctions, and, and the Norwegian media has been on us several times, and they're asking, how's the sports going? Where are, are there any difficulties? Are you, are you still uh, traveling? Will there be any changes? And then our answer from Norway is that, that this doesn't concern us. Sports is sports. We're, we're doing it. We're traveling. Uh, we're increasing our activity, uh, and then standing on the podium of the closing in ceremony at the Barnes Winter Games where Svetlana Noimova, the head of the Murmansk Sports Committee, she repeated the same words as I've been saying to the Norwegian media, only in Russian. I, I, I had to have it translated. Uh, and she said that sports will continue to be, uh, and Barnes sports will continue to be a uh, priority for Murmansk and for the uh, Russian side of the Barents region and that regardless of the, the political situation, sports will continue as normal. And, and that was, um, um, it's nice to hear it back because that's what we're saying. Uh, and, and of course we're, we're planning on continuing this uh, and the Barents Summer Games 15 sports will meet in Buda in September. Uh, around a thousand athletes. Uh, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm telling a fantastic story about how much this works. Uh, and and I, I, we have some, some areas that, that concerns us. Uh, crossing the borders is one of them. Uh, for the Finnish delegation going to Murmansk, they had to pay almost 10,000 euros for the visas to go with their delegation to Murmansk. And that may lead to them not bringing as many athletes as they would like to. Uh, so we're working uh, to get uh, easier visas, sports visas, to get uh, the costs for the visas down. And of course we hope that many of you will help us do that. And also we, we had the, the, the stories of the uh, biathlon team uh, bringing guns into, crossing the borders with guns. That, that would always be a challenge. 
shooting competitions and biathlons. So there will luckily be no bi biathlon in, in, in summer games, but uh, when we're going to Sweden in 2018, we will have the same uh, challenges, I, I can only imagine. So that's uh, Barn Sports in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. <laughs> That's a good thing, because then I told them everything they needed to know. <laughs> Thank you. As I said before, the next speaker is from the high north, but now he's not high in the skies, he's here in uh, the same room. Uh, so please welcome to Pente Malinen. He's the mayor of the regional council of Kainu, and therefore is also the chair of the Barnes Regional Council. Okay, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, inviting me here. I'm really happy to come come after the five hours waiting on the airport and still having these 10 minutes left here <laughs> to tell uh, uh, about uh, Barents Cooperation and uh, the earlier title was Importance of People-to-People -people Cooperation. Unfortunately, I haven't heard, heard those uh, presentations that were before the coffee break. Uh, <clears throat> I saw some slides and I all, uh, that are background information on the parents' cooperation, but make my points uh, directly by my speech. And also I have a background information available on the side of the door, the, our, our priorities of the chairmanship. I hope that you can pick up uh, if you don't have it. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the Barnett's uh, area that is seen on the, on the screen uh, is, is, uh, has uh, this people-to-people uh, -people, uh, cooperation very long history and, and the importance, uh, as far as I understand, comes from the geographical situation. We have always been uh, very sparsely populated and remote areas uh, uh, looked uh, from, from the capital cities and major, major uh, centers. So we have had ancient trade routes east-west a uh, very uh, uh, long time ago. We are also having some kind of borderless area uh, in the north where the Sami people live. But also, I come from a region of Kainu that is located here. I have been born here in Uhmo, very close to the border, and live there, and uh, have also the <coughs> personal uh, experience uh, on that. And also, uh, this border in my region has been for uh, 400 years in exactly on the same place between the Sweden and Novgorod, between uh, uh, Sweden and, and um, Russian, uh, and, and now between Finland and Russia. Uh, Russia. But uh, Time to time, it has been very open, especially before uh, the uh, Soviet uh, time. Uh, uh, during the Soviet time, it, uh, uh, on the contrary, was very closed. It was an obstacle for the development. And uh, uh, from my uh, experience, we have also the, uh, uh, experienced uh, the uh, opening of the border. It was. Uh, really in the Soviet time, very exceptional that uh, there was uh, um, very close to the Finnish border a very, very good mining site. Uh, 
that was opened and there was built a new mining town called Kostamus uh, 13 years ago. And it was a project that was built by the Finnish uh, uh, firms and, and uh, Russian uh, and Finnish workers together. But at that time it was uh, not allowed to, to have <laughs> people to people contacts even in that project that was so so close uh, 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 from the point of, of uh, co uh, cooperation and, and uh, communication but um, from my point of view and as, as a chairman of, of, of the regional uh, cooperation official cooperation uh, it's very important uh, uh, to uh, think about uh, what is the people-to-people -people, uh, cooperation, what is it in, in, in fact, because uh, even in, uh, in the Barents cooperation we have several levels that are not so uh, close together. We have here the Barents hierarchic council that is the official uh, work between the States and between the ministries like the Minister of Environment and, and Working Group of Environment is here. And then we have the Working Group Barents uh, Regional Council, and this is led by our, uh, uh, our uh, Member of Parliament, Timo Orhonen, and I'm uh, Chair of this Regional Committee. We have Regional com Working Groups, and then we have also Working Groups that uh, work both in the uh, state and, and regional levels. And here we have the International People's Group and, and the Joint uh, International Parent Secretariat. So we have different kinds of uh, organizations and it has been very, uh, even very challenging to, to enter <laughs> as a chairman uh, in, in the, this field. But, uh, and also um, when we, we look at this people-to-people -people, uh, uh, function or, or dimension, it, it, it depends on, on this. I uh, have to emphasize that uh, people to people uh, work is um, important, especially on the regional level. But also we have to know that uh, like sports, what that was here presented, it's not officially here, but it is very, very important as a people to people work. And also, I, I see the working group of indigenous peoples very people to people like work. And uh, as um, a chairman of, of the regional uh, council and committee, we have emphasized that we have to uh, change our way to work uh, to more and more uh, to people to people. Uh, so that uh, the NGOs, firms, young people, etc., can can be more and more involved in in the parents uh, cooperation. We, I don't uh, really mean mean that they had to be in the official work of these kind of workshops. Uh, on the contrary, we have emphasized that even even this uh, uh, this. Uh, Working groups should should have more uh, open, uh, be more open and more networked on the regions, so that they can reach uh, 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 more more people, have uh, more contacts uh, within the region. And uh, within my organization, we have uh, have a. Uh, made a team. We also, as a chairman, we are working <laughs> people to people. We have some politicians that are in the world. We have uh, some major uh, uh, civil servants working. We have some secretaries working. And we have collected a team from other uh, organizations and, and our organization to, to work together so that we can, can uh, really network Kainu in everywhere where we have importance, uh, important issues from, um, from our point of view. What are our points uh, in our uh, official chairmanships? Uh, they are here. Of course, um, we can come back in the panel, perhaps this, but uh, of course, strengthening and streamlining the regional cooperation is, as such, uh, uh, the main goal, of course, because we are, are, are responsible of, of the regionals and regions. We have 13 at the moment, and we have also an observer region, uh, North Karelia, and uh, as far as I'm 
uh, concerned, uh, I would hope that we could have also North Karelia as a full member. They were having application, but we have some doubts from one country. <laughs> The regions uh, last time, uh, but uh, but uh, this is one way we want to to open and enlarge also the the uh, cooperation field to get get new very strong and and good member uh, in our family. But uh, we also uh, try to make some uh, new elements, new ways of uh, doing the work. And one we have called communication plan. We accepted it as uh, some kind of flexible uh, uh, guideline uh, for um, communicating within these net working groups and, and, uh, com uh, and, and uh, committee and, and council, but also to the outside of the Barents region. Uh, <clears throat> This communication plan means that we want to have more uh, use of ICT, uh, video conferences, video meetings, uh, social media, etc., so that we can make it more easy to continue the work and uh, that make it more cost efficient. It is quite time so consuming to, to work with this lo long, uh, big area. But uh, we also know and feel that face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, contacts are needed. So we have tried and we were, I, I think, quite successful in Kajani last uh, two weeks ago when we had organized, uh, coordinated uh, this, uh, communi uh, this uh, committee, council and three working group meetings and also an open seminar in two days. So we were successfully uh, combined uh, different, uh, different uh, official working groups and, and also uh, other participants uh, to, to share the information and discuss. And, and in the future, we will uh, hope and, and I'm sure that we will also uh, succeed to, to uh, uh, enlarge our operation uh, with the funding uh, programs that that uh, can give uh, uh, funding in in our cooperation. So that is in short. I will show something uh, in detail here, but don't use my time. One point is that uh, we also have some similarities with the Russian chairmanship. One one point is, is tourism and also the transport and logistic is very important and it is uh, the topic uh, next week when the ministerial meeting in the Arkhangelsk is, is going on and that is why we had also in Kajani meeting the Finnish ministry of Anne Berner and, and uh, uh, we hope that this uh, uh, parents uh, transport plan would be uh, accepted as some kind of, of tool and, and kind of guideline also to the uh, state level. Um, one point I also ma made out that the culture as a sport <laughs> is also people-to-people -people, uh, cooperation. Of course, uh, in, the, in this field there is education and research. That, that is uh, very uh, important uh, university level work, but in our uh, region we have, uh, and I hope that we can also make some new progress uh, w within the culture, culture cooperation. And this is something that happened in Kajani. <laughs> some days ago. Then I point out these uh, program areas because uh, these, including the North Karelia, we have two, two uh, cross-border cooperation programs that are very important to say here in Brussels because uh, they, they are out of the sanctions and that is why they are also the most important financial instruments for, for the regional cooperation. There are some indirect programs also, but what is uh, important here to note that we have also the for example the culture, uh, the Karelia program and the promotion of the uh, people-to-people -people actions are in both uh, programs as a uh, horizontal theme. And what we in Kajani chairmanship will like to do, we will like to combine all the, all the financial instruments and the uh, managing authorities together, also to get, um, get uh, the main uh, 
stakeholders and, and uh, uh, the organizations that would like to have cooperation also in the larger area than, than these, these um, programs uh, would be. And one of the topics I would say would be uh, tourism. There's, uh, that is very strongly put in our program, but also it has turned out that there's very much uh, interest on the regions to enlarge the networks of, of tourism uh, cooperation. And I think uh, this is the only way to finance if you like to network uh, the tourism industry and tourism uh, development uh, issues on, the, on this parents area. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. And now, dear guests, we have a very short five-minute break, and then we get down to talking barns discussion.